everyone. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to the Adult Learning Conference 2022. Um, my name is Dave Hagendijk. I'm the Director of the Learning and Work Institute here in Wales, and um, I'll be hosting throughout the, the afternoon. Um, really pleased that we're, well, we're joined today by around about 170 or so delegates from across the um, adult learning sector, from FE, HE, community learning, um, the third sector, employability, etc. Um, really pleased that we've got such a breadth of delegates and also of speakers um, today. Um, first of all, a few bits of housekeeping from me before we properly kick off. So first thing you see is that the event is being recorded. Um, there is a translation available and that's uh, there are joining instructions for the translation available in the chat. Um, any problems, please um, just post in the chat. One of my colleagues will be able to help you uh, find your way through that. Um, please as well post on social media. Um, share your thoughts and views um, uh, about the conference on using the hashtag again, which is in in the chat, and um, also share anything from our uh, social media feed at Learn Work Cymru on Twitter. Um, for for the um, for some of the sessions where we'll be asking for questions, you can just post those in the um, chat function, the Q and A box, and we'll be able to pick those up and ask um, any speakers the questions. Um, we have unfortunately got one workshop today. We did have two scheduled. But colleague from um, Education Workforce Council, it's COVID, so we've had to cancel that session, unfortunately. But we will put that session back on. Uh, so, so I think it's a really important session for the sector, and we will be putting that session back on in in um, the coming weeks for you. Um, firstly, um, just a little bit on policy. I think just a little bit of a way of introduction. I think we've been running. I've been in this post for five years, and the last three or four conferences we've run. We've always felt like we've been on the cusp, on the verge of something um, within adult education. There's been a kind of political commitments, um, and it's felt like we've almost been there, but things like the right to lifelong learning, almost getting with that, getting there with that, and then obviously then having uh, COVID derail a lot of the reforms we wanted to see. I think though for the first time in the, since I've been in post, it feels like there's a genuine real political commitment to taking adult learning forward here in Wales. Uh, we want to be talking today about how we build a second chance nation and how we build the opportunities through lifelong learning. But I think it's more important than ever that it's our chance, it's our turn now as a sector um, to try and do our bit to deliver that commitment. So a couple of things from me at the start that I think we need to do as a sector. The first thing is we need to be prepared to collaborate. We can't, if we, we all try and do this alone, we all try and work alone, then I think the political reforms and the reforms you want to see in this sector to get more people into learning, I think they'll fail. Um, we need to be evidence-led, so we need to look at what works, and we also need to test new ideas and be prepared for those to fail so that we can learn about how we take the sector forward. And finally, you know, I think the really important thing for us is that we involve learners in this process, but we also involve the workforce as well. I think if we can combine learner voice and the, the voice of those at the front line of delivering, uh, delivering education, then we'll really build a system that is sustainable. Um, now, I'm really pleased uh, that I get to introduce our first speaker today, who um, I think some of you may have heard speak previously. I'm going to embarrass Scott by just saying um, he's generally one of the most um, inspiring people I've met um, in this job or in any job. And he'll hate me for saying that probably. But he's, he's his own story is one of a second chance nation, of, of a second chance and how he built that second chance nation. But also the work he's doing currently with young people up in North Wales, I think is equally inspiring. And I was going to talk to us a little bit as a way of introduction um, this afternoon. So I'm going to um, say no more because Scott will be able to introduce himself and talk about his own story far better than I will. But um, Scott, I'm going to hand over to you at this stage, if that's OK. Thank you, David. <coughs> and thank you very, very much for the, um, the invitation and uh, the opportunity to share a little bit about my learner journey. I was aware I had five minutes, so I've written it down this time. Um, so I'm trying not to go over. Um, yeah, today, you know, I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a father, a son, a teacher, and a lifelong learner. Um, these are the only labels that I will accept or carry today in my, in my life. Um, I wasn't always these things. In my previous life, I was a heroin addict, crack cocaine addict, homeless, alcoholic criminal. Um, I spent the best part of 20 years in and out of prison, on and off the streets, living in shop doorways. The streets of Soho in London was my home. Begging and shoplifting was my job. 
living hand to mouth, a daily diet of drink and drugs to keep me going, and the odd spell at Her Majesty's pleasure, an occupational hazard. I'd wake up, I would beg, I would use heroin, I would drink, I'd pass out in a doorway, and I would repeat every single day. It was like Groundhog Day. Um, I had dreams, I had aspirations. I used to watch the <laughs> normal people going about their business as I was sitting in the doorway, going to work, going shopping, out having meals with friends, laughing, joking, living life. And I would sit there in my doorway, pondering my childhood dream of owning a Lambretta scooter. I dreamt of being somebody, of having a family, a life, children. I dreamt of being normal. Being one of those people I would watch from my doorway, walking by with their suitcases, going on holiday and living their lives. I had dreams and aspirations, but alcohol and drugs took them all. Second chances, I had many of them. Every time I was released from prison was a second chance, but I knew no better. Before I knew it, I was back on the gear, back on the streets. It was like I was hardwired to fail. Wake up, beg, use heroin drink, pass out the doorway and repeat, back in the cycle again. But then in 2005, um, whilst I was, um, I was on a particular crossroads in my life, I was living in a homeless hostel. My arms were ruined from, from the injecting and my legs were swollen from thrombosis, desperate for things to change. A key worker suggested that I apply for a college place at a place in North Wales called Colic Harlech. Um, and that college, interestingly, was fondly known as the Second Chance University. It was a residential, three meals a day, a roof over my head, and I dived headlong into lifelong learning, and I absolutely loved it. At College Harlech, I was surrounded by like-minded people, desperate for a new life, led by inspirational teachers who cared, and like really cared. The teachers and the staff just really wanted you to become the best version of you that you could be. I always joke that I'm sure that Maslow based his theory on, uh, on Harlech because it was all, all there from the bottom to the top. Physiological needs, safety needs, love and acceptance, esteem and self-actualization. And I was like a sponge. I absolutely loved it. At 35 years old, I'd finally found something and I'd become somebody. I'd become a learner, a student, and I was doing something. I had dreams and visions and it didn't end there. Education transformed my life and actually, no, <laughs> education transformed me. My old thinking, my old patterns of behaviour, how I saw myself and I started to question who I am and what is my purpose. And today I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a son, a teacher, a lifelong learner. I'm a man of faith, but there is a saying that uh, faith without works is dead. And my works, well, I found them through my second chance, which was um, the vehicle for me being lifelong learning. And my life today couldn't possibly look any more different than what it was all those years ago. I'm sitting here in my office now of the charity that I run in North Wales, working with young people and trying to help them not go down the path that I was once on. And maybe meeting some of them on the crossroads that I found myself on, pointing them in the direction of their second chance. And I do thank God every day for all these people, all you people, institutions that's made it all possible. A few years ago, I was privileged to win an award from the Learning and Work Institute, and that award opened the door to more opportunities. And today, I believe you're going to be hearing about TITH, the new International Learning Exchange Programme. As part of the old Erasmus programme with the Learning and Work Institute, I was able to travel to other European countries, something I would never have dared to dream. On those trips, I saw firsthand how lifelong learning was impacting the lives of people around Europe. And I was able to bring back what I'd learned back home to Wales. But also on those trips, I saw firsthand the impact of the trips themselves on both myself and the other learners and tutors. I saw participants on those trips grow before my very eyes, their confidence and self-esteem blossoming. Um, so I am really, really excited about the opportunities that uh, that lay ahead with Tithe. And to be honest, I can't wait to put an application in because uh, I would love to take some of the people that I work with today and uh, and see them experience what I've, you know, experienced myself and many, many others. You know, a truly 
life-changing experience. So I want to thank you for everybody that's here today, the Minister and David, this amazing team. Um, and thank you, everyone, for helping make Wales um, a nation of second chances. So I think that's my five minutes. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. I think in, under normal circumstances, you have a big round of applause from everyone in the room. Um, but I think it's a really inspiring story. And I think you also, what you didn't touch on, and you can see the logo behind you, is the Youth Sheds movement. And you only touched on that, obviously, and there'll hopefully be opportunities to talk about that in the future. <laughs> An amazing initiative. And um, I hope, um, well, we will we'll certainly send around details of that to colleagues. I think you're doing fantastic work with young people in North Wales. And thank you ever so much for the, the, okay. the life-changing opportunity you're giving those young people um, as well. Um, okay. okay, really pleased um, now to have the opportunity to introduce our uh, keynote speaker today, which is uh, the Minister, Jeremy Miles. Um, and I talked at the start about um, political commitment and political will, giving us the opportunity to transform the opportunities of, for adult learning in the sector. And, and there has been, and obviously the Minister will talk about this in more detail, but the commitment to Second Chance Nation, the commitment to um, adult learning review that was promised in the manifesto does have the opportunity to, I think, to really transform the sector here in Wales. And I'm really, really pleased Jeremy has found time today to um, speak to us. So I won't um, delay the introduction any longer. And I hope um, I can't see Jeremy on my screen, but I have, I'm pretty sure he's there. So I'll hand over at this stage um, to the minister. Well, um, good afternoon all, and thank you, David, for those kind words, and thank you all very much for the invitation to address the conference today and to the Learning and Work Establishment for organizing this very important conference, and I'm very glad the conference is concentrating on building a second chance nation where it's never too late to learn, and I hope you, like me, are always excited to be able to meet to discuss the work that we can do together to support adults on the journey lifelong journey it's something that i feel personally very strongly about and it's every time inspirational to be part of this type of discussion and to be able to learn from your experience that makes this difference in the lives of so many people. Before I start on what I want to say, I just want to say, if I may, Scott, it's just incredibly inspiring listening uh, listening to your story. Dave told us it would be, but I mean, it genuinely is uh, very moving, actually, to hear how education has transformed your life uh, and uh, potentially the lives of many, many others as well. Um, and I hope that you do achieve your ambition uh, of a shed in every town. Obviously, you're proud of what you've achieved, as you should be, and we we celebrate with that with you and congratulate you for uh, for that. Diane, Diane Scott, and Papa the Chiwidi. Well done, Scott, for everything you succeeded today. Anyway. Then of a second uh, nation, nation of second chances, um, and let me uh, start, I guess, by acknowledging that I know there's been a bit of a debate uh, around the term um, and what it might mean um, that's not uh, a new phenomenon uh, we started by hearing uh, from Scott but there's another Scott uh, that I just want to refer to uh, maybe a little improbably uh, in the context uh, of uh, an adult lifelong learning conference and that is of course um, F Scott Fitzgerald um, critics uh, and commentators alike uh, often quote his maxim that there are uh, no second acts in American lives um, and it's meant to sum up uh, that idea of uh, you know, one shot, one chance uh, rule of public life or of careers or of, of politics. Well, I fundamentally disagree with that worldview. And when it comes to education, our lives should not and must not uh, depend on one shot, one chance, one pathway, one decision. It must never be too late to learn or to become more democratically and critically engaged through education, or to learn that new skill, to acquire that new qualification, to become more personally, more culturally, and more academically fulfilled. 
I want Wales to be that nation of second chances uh, in education. Um, and uh, Scott Fitzgerald was actually on to something. The full quote, uh, which people, people often overlook, uh, says, I once thought there were no acts, no second acts uh, in American lives, but there was certainly to be a second act to New York's boom days. That's the full quote. Uh, colleagues, out of necessity, really, um, much of my first year, the first act, you might say, uh, as Education uh, and Welsh Language Minister has focused on uh, working with you to keep uh, the nation learning through the pandemic. And I want to thank you for everything that you've done over the last two years in incredibly uh, challenging times. But for our second act, I, we uh, really, we must focus relentlessly uh, on the central role that education will have uh, in creating those boom days, if you like, that I'm confident uh, lie ahead for Wales again. And the role it will play in breaking that link between deprivation and destiny, in cr creating and nurturing uh, employable, engaged, ethical citizens of all ages, uh, and in raising standards uh, and widening access through digital uh, and through technology. And these aspirations are no less relevant in tertiary education, including uh, adult and community learning than they are to our schools. So I want to spend some time today exploring how we can move forward together uh, in this endeavour. And even if there are no second acts in American lives, I'm determined that Wales should be a nation of second chances uh, and that we can realise that ambition together. And as Scott was saying, uh, there are many opportunities at second chances throughout any individual life. Uh, but firstly, I want to thank you for uh, all you've done as a sector taking on the challenge of working with us to uh, implement a new funding and planning model with parity and with equity at its heart. Um, there is, of course, further to go, but we now have a sound platform, I think, to build on. And I want to discuss how we do that in the context of four uh, approaches. The first is the importance of strategy and uh, strategic duty. The second is the shared responsibility that we all have for this. The third is the need for sustainability. Um, and finally, that idea of second chances. So turning to the first of these, uh, the strategy uh, and the strategic duties, uh, there is something exciting, I think, happening uh, in Welsh law and lifelong learning at the moment. And I recognise as a lawyer that the bar for what counts uh, as exciting in the world of law is probably a little bit uh, lower for me than perhaps for others. But let me remind you, in the uh, tertiary education uh, and research bill, we recently passed the general principle stage in the Senate, which I'm very pleased about. Um, and for the first time ever, uh, we are legislating to promote uh, lifelong learning. We are putting it uh, into law, making it a duty uh, on the new tertiary uh, commission and making it the first uh, such strategic duty uh, in the bill. Uh, you may not have spotted it in the bill when it was uh, published, uh, last year, uh, and there's a good reason for that. It wasn't, it wasn't in there. But on becoming minister, uh, I took the view that we needed to put more of our um, vision, our values, and our ambitions uh, on the face of the bill itself. And for me, that starts with uh, lifelong learning and with adult community learning at the heart of that. And it sits alongside those other important duties uh, which enshrine those uh, shared principles and shared values that I just mentioned. Uh, equality of opportunity, uh, of collaboration, uh, of tertiary education through the medium of Welsh, uh, of civic mission, um, and of a global outlook. Um, and the new commission, which will be a, a new steward, really, for all tertiary education and research, will operate under those uh, principles and will implement those duties and it links very clearly 
uh, to the purposes and principles of our new national school curriculum, empowering our young people to learn throughout their lives. Uh, and the curriculum represents uh, what we want and expect from the citizens of the future, guaranteeing the core skills of literacy, numeracy, uh, and digital competence. Uh, it will empower uh, learners to grow as citizens through a broad and balanced set of experiences uh, knowledge and skills and it shares I think a lot in common with uh, the Learning and Work Institute's innovative citizens curriculum uh, that looks to tackle uh, the barriers that prevent adult learner participation so that learning those essential and life skills such as literacy and numeracy can become more relevant through uh, co-construction with learners and through using community delivery. Um, although it's a new approach, it's rooted in that adult education tradition of community, culture and citizenship. And engaging with uh, and empowering adults to access public services, to be engaged citizens and to enjoy uh, improved health, improved employment outcomes. I think this is a, an idea with real potential for us in Wales. So uh, I want to tell you that I have asked our new external reference group for adult learning to study uh, this approach and to make some recommendations to me on how we can pilot uh, a citizen's curriculum for Wales in Wales. Our new school curriculum was co-constructed uh, with those who have the experience of teaching uh, our young people. So I want us to draw on that uh, way of working, that spirit of co-development and co-production and ally that to the expertise and experience at this conference so we can design uh, a national framework which is ready to be adapted, designed and delivered uh, locally. And that brings me to my next theme, which is uh, that idea of shared responsibility. Uh, for this endeavour. Blending the national and the local with learners uh, at the centre is fundamental to my idea of shared responsibility. And I mentioned the new reference uh, group for adult learning a couple of moments ago. Uh, it met actually, uh, as some of you will know, for the first time uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, influenced by uh, Sue Pember's excellent report for the Wales Centre for Public Policy, and I know that Sue is speaking uh, a little later. Um, and the group will, uh, has come together uh, to look at those systemic barriers uh, that lie uh, in our path. And you know, we all know that they are complex uh, and that they are long-standing. So we are going to need to be uh, imaginative uh, and cre creative in how we tackle them. And the next two years, I think, are going to be crucial uh, in building the capacity and the uh, capability that we need in order to deliver this commitment. Um, so in helping to co-design uh, a programme of national coordination, uh, the group will provide advice and provide scrutiny um, and ensure that we reach um, as wide a constituency uh, as possible. And I'm pleased uh, also to say that I've provided funding of two million pounds over the next two years uh, to back up this work and to help contribute to getting uh, the sector ready for the future. We must have a programme of national coordination based on close collaboration between providers, just as uh, David was talking about at the start. So my ask of you all here today uh, is to engage with that uh, so that we can work with and across the whole uh, tertiary education system in that cooperative and collaborative way that we know will uh, be more effective uh, in the end. Our shared challenge uh, is to improve quality uh, and access to uh, skills-based, to formal and informal adult learning and to support progression for all our learners. And we have to get this right uh, as we move ahead with the creation of the Commission for 
tertiary education and research. The Commission will be taking on responsibility, as many of you will know, for the funding and the overall strategic direction uh, of adult learning, in addition to further education, higher education, apprenticeships, uh, and school six forms. And it'll provide the funding to local authorities, to colleges, uh, to Adult Learning Wales, um, which is so, so crucial to realizing uh, the mission of adult education. But it will do it with, um, I think, a renewed uh, strategic focus based in legislation, as I've said, uh, on enabling uh, and ensuring lifelong learning for people from all walks of life. Um, and the Commission will also be responsible for signing off outcome agreements with colleges uh, and with universities. Um, and I want us to be in a position where those institutions uh, reflecting that uh, lifelong learning duty are in the habit, if you like, of disseminating their work more widely, whether that's online, whether it's taster courses, uh, public lectures and seminars, uh, working with uh, local employers, with enterprises. We need to see wider uh, and deeper uh, engagement. Uh, and though we talk of uh, civic mission, uh, this isn't uh, missionary work, uh, as uh, my late friend Howell Francis described it. Rather, it's genuine empowerment uh, and democratic engagement. Uh, so I expect to see this as a key priority within those outcome agreements in the future. And alongside that, uh, I'm also keen to explore the idea of a national charter for lifelong learning. Uh, the role uh, of supporting people on their learning journey to help them to flourish um, and help strengthen our communities in doing so extends actually beyond uh, education institutions to partners such as uh, libraries, uh, museums, but can also reach uh, beyond that again to other public bodies and indeed further perhaps to, uh, to technology, to media and indeed other companies. How can we uh, develop an approach where these can all sign up to agreed principles uh, and actions, importantly, uh, that support community and lifelong learning? I want us to do more to encourage this work, particularly as it relates to uh, citizenship education, tackling misinformation um, and questions of digital competence. I know the uh, director of the National Museum, for example, describes that institution um, as a central service for learning. Uh, and I want to embed uh, that spirit and that sense of shared endeavor and shared responsibility. Uh, next, uh, I spoke about sustainability. Um, and I think we're at a critical juncture in co-creating a sustainable and strong system. How we harness uh, digital learning and technology is essential to that sustainability. The idea of coming together to learn, to break down barriers, to engage uh, and explore, that's all essential to education uh, as a public and common good. Um, and this must be true whether it's in the classroom, in the community or uh, online. I've already provided um, almost uh, six million pounds to improve uh, the digital capacity um, and to address the challenges of net zero in the adult learning and college sectors um, and a further two million pounds allocated to the network of local authority adult learning to re-engage um, some of those perhaps hardest to reach learners uh, in our society and to support uh, the promotion and delivery of engagement uh, and provision. And building on uh, the experience over the last two years, I'm keen to do more to support the adult learning sector to broaden its reach uh, through digital and blended learning as part of the offer. We've made tailored support available to the sector through JISC uh, to help each provider uh, build its digital capabilities. Um, and through the reference group um, and the programme of national coordination, it's really imperative 
that we look at how we can take this forward and find further opportunities in this area, including uh, more shared resources for adult learning. So in schools and colleges, we have the incredible asset actually uh, of what is a globally recognized um, hub learning platform. Um, what could be an equivalent platform? What could that look like for adult learners? A destination which is trusted, which is well known, uh, with a wide offer of content, resources, training, guidance, and where the content is straightforward to access, easily navigable, um, and convenient. And I'm keen to hear from learners and from the sector what potential this could have to support adult learning. I know that uh, adult learning is a lifeline uh, for so many people and staying connected was hugely important during lockdown. One local authority said to us that one vulnerable isolated learner living alone cried when the equipment was delivered to her and said she felt part of the world again now that she can see people and i think through the last two years many learners have found their way online and become familiar with remote learning but we also have to recognize that the social personal and the well-being impact of this period means that many are even further away from learning we already know that 24% of adults are without a level two qualification, 14% without a level one, and almost half of adults from the lower socioeconomic groups have not received any training since they left full-time education. Now we have to tackle that and to tackle that together. We've got ambitious targets to reduce the numbers of working age adults with no qualifications to 5% or below, and to ensure that 75% of working age adults in Wales are qualified to at least level three by 2050. But it's been over a decade since the last national audit of adult literacy skills in Wales. And it's about time that we corrected that and to get an up-to-date view of the situation alongside data about qualifications and the targets. So I've asked my officials to commission a new state of the nation audit of adult literacy and numeracy to address this. In creating that nation of second chances where it's never too late to learn, we first need to be honest and understand the scale of the challenge. And so I'll have more to say about uh, this audit uh, in the coming weeks. The sustainability of the workforce is integral in how we move forward successfully as well. And over the last two years, we've been able to allocate £175,000 to the adult learning sector to support uh, mental health and professional development. And much of that has been focused on well-being support, helping to build res resilience uh, for both staff um, and for learners. And we'll continue to work closely with you to make sure that the support is there, the right support is there and in place. The post-16 uh, workforce development project is currently underway to develop a professional learning framework for staff across all parts of the post-16 uh, sector. And adult learning plays an important part uh, in this work. Um, and I'm pleased that representatives from the sector are engaged through the steering group and through the task and finish groups. The three themes that I've discussed so far, strategy, shared responsibility and sustainability, uh, all lead into my overarching fourth theme, that idea of a nation of second chances where it's never too late to learn. And I mentioned the misinterpretation uh, of one of F. Scott Fitzgerald's famous lines at the start. Well, he also said, no grand idea was ever born in a conference. But colleagues, I can assure you the idea of a second chance nation was not born in a conference, but I know that it will develop um, and evolve and become tangible through the contributions and the ideas and deliber deliberations uh, of people in this conference and uh, beyond. And we've already started to 
build that uh, new approach, that new future. The new bill will place a duty on the Commission to secure proper facilities for relevant further education and training for eligible adults. Now that's a big step forward uh, in adult provision and it will be backed up by funding and we will work with you to define the scope of that uh, in regulations over the coming two years. My long-term vision is of that universal right to lifelong learning to give every citizen that opportunity. And we need to work together collaboratively to increase the numbers of adults learning in Wales. I don't want us to narrow our sights. I was struck by uh, Sir Alan Tuckett's recent words and analysis that we must move away from the binary consideration of the purpose of adult and lifelong learning. He said there'd been too narrow a focus on investment as a choice between vocational education and neglected education for citizenship and cultural fulfillment. Economic prosperity and social cohesion, he said, both benefit from sustained commitments to lifelong learning, and I couldn't agree more. And I'm determined that that is the spirit that we move forward. Initiatives like TIGHT that we've heard a bit about and we'll hear more about our new global uh, education exchange programme show the importance that we attach to creating those new opportunities. I know Susanna, who is the director of TITH, is going to be talking to you about the programme, but I just wanted to say it's the best funded uh, international mobility programme in Wales ever, um, with significant funding available for applications specifically uh, from the adult learning sector this year. So let's make the most of this uh, exciting opportunity um, and specifically the exciting opportunities that TITH provides for adult learners and staff across the nation. So I just want to conclude, uh, colleagues, um, by saying I'm confident that we do have those boom days that we talked about earlier uh, for adult learning ahead of us. It'll require us to keep the faith, uh, to share responsibility, uh, to create those oppor opportunities that are truly sustainable there's an old Welsh uh, proverb that many of you will know that says three times lucky for a Welshman, but uh, education chances and true lifelong learning shouldn't and must not be a matter of luck. Uh, a true nation of second chances is one where we work together, build that shared uh, citizenship, tackle the impact of poverty on aspiration, on opportunity, and on education itself, and nothing uh, is more important uh, for a modern and successful economy, for empowered communities, for a fair uh, and inclusive society, uh, than that idea of a nation where it's never too late to learn. Thank you, uh, Minister. And uh, interesting when we have some of these um, speeches, sometimes we um, often uh look for what's not in a speech and actually there was an awful lot of content in there i think about how we can take the um sector forward now i i think we've got an opportunity um to ask um to, some questions if that's okay um yeah there we are you're back on my screen now great <laughs> thank you um we'll just be there. and, yeah, and um, delegates may notice that i'm not jeff greenwich um jeff was due to um do the q a today um but jeff has been it's also a chair of Bridgen college and he's been called away to help with an inspection there. So rightly prioritising that um, today. So um, I, I was going to ask you a couple of questions first, if I could, Minister, and then um, I'll take some questions. If people want to put questions in the Q&A um, uh, who, who are attending, I'll, I'll be able to pick some of those up as well. Um, so there's an awful lot of content in there. There's an awful lot of good news, I think, in there, which is really, really good to see. Um, one of the areas I wanted to kind of pick out in a little, perhaps a little bit more detail, was the kind of practical differences that you want to see from the new commission in respect of um, um, trying to improve opportunities for adult learners, because there will be that will be the new duty. And perhaps you can't say too much about how the commission will deliver the new duty, but I'd be interested in what the kind of some of the practical changes you, you might you might be hoping the commission to deliver. Well, I mean, you, you started, David, by talking about the importance of all parts of the sector working collaboratively. And, you know, we've got a stream of work going on at the moment uh, through the external reference group, which is around developing a kind of approach to national 
uh, coordination. But uh, you know, I, I very much see uh, the the uh, role and opportunity from the Commission in supporting that work of building a kind of coherent um, uh, adult community learning uh, sector where all parts under, you know, understand their relationship to each other and that are able to provide, um, I think, a more sort of um, navigable path for learners than currently exists. You know, there's an awful lot of provision of different sorts in different parts of the sector, which kind of converge around the learner in a way which makes it very difficult sometimes for the learner to know which path to to follow. And I think we've got to tackle that as part of the work of the new commission. I very much hope that that will be you know an early priority for the commission. Um, on a kind of practical uh, basis, I, mean, I touched in the. Um, I touched in the uh, in the comments I was making on the new duty. So there's a broad duty in the in the in the um, in the bill as I talked about, but then there's a specific uh, duty to fund um, uh, further education and training, which includes adult, uh, adult community learning for eligible adults. And it's a it, what needs to happen when the bill is passed is to define that so that that becomes you know the crystallisation of the you know the, the next step of the lifelong journey lifelong learning journey in law um, and the good news is there will be money attached you know there's there'll be funding attached to that so it's um i know that some have feared that that will you know draw funding from other parts of the system but actually you know um we'll be funding we'll be providing additional funding for that duty and i think that will then you know the the, the vision is that becomes progressively expanded um in the future and that's the tool that then drives uh, expanded provision um across all parts of the um uh post 16 sector you know, absolutely and i think there were certainly there were certainly concerns i think initially with the, with the bill um that it wouldn't recognize the value and the importance of lifelong learning and adult learning i think you know i, I generally think the changes you made and the content of what we're hearing now i think moves us away from that which is really positive um i want to just pick up um on um a couple of points well, one of the comments that's come in in the chat and then yeah. potentially around that as well was one of them i think is um I know you have already mentioned this a little bit, but it's the kind of the role, particularly of the adult community learning sector in yeah. um, delivering a vision for a second chance nation. But also one of the comments that I think is really important, it's around what is the role of small community venues in potentially delivering this? Because these are the hubs in many of our communities where you wait the only place potentially you can access physical in-person adult learning within easy reach of, as well as the adult community learning sector and the potentially that kind of third sector as well and the and the role of small community venues as well well i think it is really important you know i think i i know from my own constituency how absolutely fundamental the kind of you know physical space in the community where people can you know maybe re-engage with learning if they've not been in, a, in an education setting for a long time uh, can be and how you know it, i think it's really important that as we talk about the digital blended offer which you know is clearly going to be an, uh, an essential component of provision in the future you know that cannot obviously become the only provision can it is you've got to have community-based provision in the sorts of locations that you're talking about because you know not everyone a feels able to engage and to learn um online in the same way that others might be able to but also on just a very human level you know education is essentially a kind of collaborative effort isn't it it's a kind of collective effort in many ways and that idea of being together with people is an important aspect of education of any sort and i think perhaps particularly important aspect when you're re-engaging with your learner journey perhaps after many years in some cases so i actually think that that you know physical um, location is a really important part of it and the point you're making you know about the contribution more broadly obviously whether it's around essential skills or ESOL or employability all, all those are absolutely crucial but I think there's an opportunity really to go beyond that you know I think some of the very interesting work that um, that the Learning and Work Institute have been doing in the citizens curriculum space is around how you develop that broader framework um, around some of those life capabilities, if you like, whether it's financial literacy, whether it's health literacy, civic literacy. And I think there's a very, you know, there's a fantastic opportunity for us there and a very rich agenda, which, you know, your your organisation has led on for, for some time. And I'm keen to see what more we can do in Wales on that. I'm really excited about the prospect of developing something around a citizen's curriculum, certainly. Um, linked to that is a, a comment, one of the questions we've had come in is around 
how do we, you know, what, what, what is the possibility of um, developing a viable funding model for the provision of non-accredited courses? So those kind of courses, as you were talking about, that are kind of hook and engagement activities, the ones that potentially support well-being, but also lead people back into that, into that kind of, you know, longer learning journey and progression. You know, it, and that sometimes I think providers find some of that hard to fund and hard yeah. to on a sustainable basis. Is that certainly part of your thinking about looking at, looking at that? Well, it's it's. I think it's you know my my perception of it is you know it, it's harder to fund because it doesn't respond to the metrics that government most often use to allocate funding. You know, so you know it doesn't have that qualification at the end of it, or you know the, sometimes the hard metrics which are used by government for that that funding purpose aren't so easily describable in in that part of the sector. But you know, I think in particular after the experience of the last two years, we all know that. You know, you can't, you know, even if you've been away from education for a short period of time, there needs to be a period where you're re-engaging with the kind of the, the motivation, the confidence, the self-confidence that you need in order to be able to be, you know, an effective learner and to make, make the most of those opportunities. And sometimes those are, you know, those are courses that aren't, you know, strictly at the heart of the employability um, agenda. They're kind of more diverse than that. And I think we would absolutely lose um, a, a really important part of provision if we if we if we disregard that I think on the broader funding question um, so you know this in order to make a reality of an ambitious lifelong learning strategy you're, you're going to have to have a mixed provision aren't you so some of it will be entirely funded some of it will be co-funded and I think it's you know there are different there's a different role for those different models at different points in your journey aren't there obviously um, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, with the sector's help has been very productive in the last uh, year or two is that greater parity of funding um, across the different geographies of Wales. Now, obviously, that's been challenging if you look at the headline figures for some authorities in particular, because there's been quite a swing, hasn't there, in some areas. But what I what I want to try and do, at least, um, is to kind of is to try and smooth out those differences. I don't myself feel it particularly sensible, um, given that we're moving towards probably in 2024, you know, regulations which create a different landscape in terms of post-16. It doesn't make a huge amount of sense to me to make big difference, you know, big changes in the interim period. So I think I'm trying to make sure that funding pattern is smooth, if you like, over the next couple of years. I think, and I may have time to squeeze in, I think, one more question uh, before you have to go, um, if that's OK. And there's, there are a few more questions coming in the chat, and perhaps we could send those to you as well, yes. if that's OK. But yes. This one, I think, that's a really important one here, um, which has come in. You mentioned um, in terms of the commission and the duty, and you talked about eligible adults, um, the funding for eligible adults. And there's kind of, could you touch a little bit more on you know, how and when will this eligibility for, you know, be, be, be defined and be, uh, be developed? Yeah, well, that's one of the early tasks. You know, we're, we're focusing our uh, efforts and resources at the moment, making sure the legislation is um, is passed through the Senev. And naturally, um, and understandably, you know, in that process, colleagues say, "Well, we'd like to see these regulations now." And you know, I suppose in a you know in the ideal world, that might be possible. However, you know, you can't really do that till you know what the bill says, and you want also to give stakeholders plenty of time to be able to kind of engage on that in a way which I think you can't really do as the legislation is going through. So it'll be one of our very first priorities um, when the legislation is passed, and I, it'll definitely be done in a way which is co-constructed. So we will want to talk to the sector about your views about how that should be defined. You know, there'll obviously be questions of resort, you know, constraints of resources and all those, you know, real world challenges that we all obviously understand. But, you know, we will want to talk to you about how best to do that. Great, thank you. I say I'm going to miss out a couple of questions there, so I appreciate it. I know your time, you'll have to leave. But um, so the question from Wales TC around workplace funding and other things like that, so I'll definitely um, we'll send those on to you. Yeah. And, um, I just want to say thank you for your time today. And thank you, I think, also for the opportunity that, that what you've talked about today gives the sector to try and develop something better for learners and I think really the onus is now on us working with you and your colleagues and uh, officials to actually make this a reality. I think it's very very easy sometimes to sit back and just throw stuff at people and say you're not doing enough. Well actually I think you are doing more and let's, we've got to take that opportunity I think and translate it into, into reality for people. So 
Thank you ever so much for your time today, Mr. Really appreciate it. And thank you for yours, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, hopefully now, um, I again, see, I'm not Jeff, and I, Jeff was going to introduce our next speaker, but we've already heard a little bit about this, um, about the Tithe programme today. Uh, the minister mentioned it. I know Scott, you mentioned it, and we're already starting to have conversations right across um, the sector about this now. And we've been lucky enough, along with our colleagues and friends in Adult Learning Wales, to be responsible to help promote the um, adult strands of the Tithe programme. And I'm um, really pleased today that uh, Susanna Galvin Hand, as the director uh, of that, is, is here to speak to us today about the opportunities for the sector. Um, from that programme and after this as well, a bit later on today, there'll be a workshop as well that we'll be leading to talk about the kind of practical um, elements of the programme. So, Suzanne, I'm going to hand over to you if that's okay. Thank you. Um, I'll try to say a few Welsh words to start. Um, so, Diolchama Gwahodiad i Aner Gerhadle. Thank you to address the conference today. Man any gefluino tight ichi. So I hope you could understand that. Uh, it's never too late to learn a new language. Uh, I have a deal with my colleague Walter where he teaches me a little bit of Welsh and I teach him a little bit of Catalan. So there you go. That's that's where I come from originally. So thank you very much for having me and giving me the opportunity to introduce Tithe to all of you. As a way of context, perhaps, uh, as we all know, Wales places strategic value and importance uh, on education. We heard from the minister as well on lifelong learning, on educational exchanges, and of course, on international mobility as well. And we know that international mobility remains a priority for Wales and for the education sector overall internationally. There's a lot data out there as well that shows us the benefits of international experiences, of international collaboration and exchanges. I mean, we heard from Scott earlier. I mean, we were all super inspired by what you shared and, you know, the, the positive impact that those opportunities had on you. I mean, I was born in the 70s in Barcelona um, as a Catalan at, at that time. Franco, I, I actually was born into a dictatorship, believe it or not, he was still alive. Uh, and, you know, I grew up in a very narrow minded society at, the, at that time. And of course, my dream was to kind of see the world and, and, and engage with something different to what I had been used to. And we know that those opportunities um, give fantastic uh, impact and deliver really positive benefits. We also know from data that the the, these opportunities deliver greater impact to those people from widening participation backgrounds as well. And that's really important. Uh, if we look at the world today, of course, we know we're facing serious global challenges. And this uh, context, and again, Scott, you refer to the fact that you're a father and myself being a mother, we, we worry about the future for, for the younger generations coming after us. And I think in this kind of context, um, it reminds us of the even the higher importance and the uh, of international connections, of international exchanges, and of intercultural understanding. Of course, you know, in the, la the last few years have been also been challenging around Brexit and the UK trying to define the new relationship with Europe and the, with the world. Um, uh, it was unfortunate that the UK decided not to uh, continue to participate in the Erasmus program. And of course, we also had two years of COVID. Um, and in, in that context as well, there's been a bit of an opportunity for everyone in the sector, for policymakers as well, to reflect, to review, to refine international strategies and international mobility strategies moving forward. So as you know, TITHE, or the International Learning Exchange Program, was launched exactly one year ago. It was announced by the government uh, in March 2021. Uh, at the time, again, it was called ILEP, the International Learning Exchange Program for Wales. And this is a program that the uh, Welsh government committed to, and we heard from the minister earlier, uh, with, a, with a large commitment of funding, a uh, commitment of 65 million pounds over a period of four years. The program itself was launched uh, in February this year, 
uh, and he, uh, after uh, a naming competition, uh, he was named Tithe. And of course, I don't need to tell you that Tithe means journey in, in Welsh. The program is available for not just learners, but also for staff, uh, educators, teachers, uh, administration staff, researchers, and so on across all sectors of education in Wales, schools, youth organizations, further education, vocational education and training, higher education, and of course, adult learning and adult education. The first few months, I mean, it's incredible that it was just announced a year ago and, and here we are, but it was initiated through uh, in-depth consultations with all the involved sectors. So the first few months, um, looking back at the summer last year, uh, we went through quite a detailed consultation with the sectors, with the ambition to make sure that this program is truly collaborative, is truly co-designed, and that it ultimately it meets the sector needs. And at the very heart of this consultation was how can we work together to make sure that tithe best benefits the, all the sectors involved to ensure that all participants gain maximum benefit and that the program is truly inclusive. So the program around three pathways. So there'll, there'll be funding calls around three different pathways. Pathway one was uh, open or launched at the beginning of March. Uh, so applications are now open, uh, which is fantastic to see that now we're moving into the delivery phase. And this pathway focuses on funding for mobilities. So for mobilities of participants. Pathways two and three will come a little bit further down the line. Pathway two will be focusing on collaboration and partnerships, and pathway three will focus on capacity building. And pathways two and three are designed to ensure a degree of sustain sustainability for the program and to ensure that we, that we embed mobility and internationalization as the core activity. A very important aspect and principle of Tithe as well is reciprocity and two-way exchanges. So the funding allows for bids for both outward uh, as well as inward mobility. So outward mobility from Wales to the world and from the world into Wales. The program, I mean, the strategy was published when the program was launched at the beginning of, of March. Um, and you can have a look at the strategy, but there's lots of aims and, and, and a lot of uh, underlying principles and commitments. But let me highlight some that I think are particularly relevant in the context of adult education. And I think that are really important in making Tithe a truly Welsh program. One of them, and I think the minister referred to some of this earlier, is to make sure that the program delivers an inclusive and all Wales program, and that through that we get more people involved in international exchanges. So the inclusivity aspect is, is really, really important for us. And, and that's why all of the sectors that are involved will participate. Also that the program promotes collaborations between organizations in Wales and collaboration and with institutions around the world. So through building links, supporting education sectors, and that includes, of course, the adult education sector as well. Another important aspect of it is the how Tithe aims to raise the international profile of Wales as an open and outward looking and a globally responsible nation. And this aligns with Wales international strategy, which I believed was launched in 2020. The and that I would like to highlight is the, the focus on improving and widening access and equality of opportunities. And again, Jeremy made mention to this for people with additional learning needs, people with disabilities, underrepresented groups, and people from disadvantaged backgrounds. That the program also keeps at its heart uh, an ambition to promote the Welsh language and the Welsh culture and showcasing Wales to the world. And also considering climate change that the program also encourages uh, sustainable travel. I think if we look back at the consultation and focusing a little bit more on the adult learning sector, I think one tangible outcome that came out of the consultation with you 
was um, the establishment uh, of the Tithe International Strategy Group. And this was created to coordinate activity within the sector and make sure that we developed a strategic and joined up approach together with you. The consultation also made it very evident uh, that there is a really strong desire from the sector to build international links and international partnerships and a solid foundation for future activities moving forward. And we hope that in that sense, Pathways 2, uh, which again, Pathway 2 is about collaboration and partnership, and Pathway 3, which is about capacity building, will provide opportunities around these ambitions. Thirdly, uh, Tithe also has committed funding to support what we call sector organizing bodies. The sector organizing bodies uh, are there and the main role is to support organizations within uh, the sectors that they represent to make sure that those sectors engage with Tithe, uh, that they feel confident to engage with Tithe. Uh, to support those particular organizations that maybe have very little experience or no experience at all of international work and that they equip them with the tools and the information and the skills to engage and participate in Tithe. The sector organizing bodies are organizations with a great experience of international education exchanges themselves and of course they have direct experience of the sectors they support. And as David mentioned, we are delighted to have Learning and Work Institute, Camry and Adult Learning Wales as the sector organizing body for the adult learning sector. Just to some kind of sum up and to wrap up, I mean, just to highlight that this is the first time that Wales is developing its own mobility program. Um, and the minister made reference to the large amount of funding that has been committed to this. And, in, on behalf of the team, uh, Tithe team, we are very proud that we have gone a long way since the program announced uh, a year ago, that the applications are now open. I don't know if you've seen the website uh, and you know it, it, it kind of looks fantastic. We've got you as the sector organizing bodies and we're so excited to be working with you. It is generating a lot of positive interest. I joined the team about eight weeks ago, this is my eighth week, uh, not that I'm counting, um, but since I joined the team as the executive director, the Tithe is generating so much interest since, since it was launched on the 4th of March, not just in Wales, but across the border as well and internationally. I've, I've spoken now at quite a number of fora uh, at, in different sectors, and I've talked to a lot of international partners who are really, really, keen to engage with us. Only next week I'll be, I've been invited to give a full presentation to all EU uh, member states just to talk about Tithe uh, and, and they're so keen to be part of this. And I think um, a lot of international partners are looking at Wales in a very positive light for their interest and their commitment to international exchange. And can I just finish by saying that while the program has been often referred to as a successor to Erasmus, to be honest, moving forward, what we, our vision and our ambition really is to develop and deliver a program that is uniquely Welsh, that is from Wales and for Wales, and that we feel confident in the program's own identity and unique identity. So we're not just another Erasmus, but we are tithe in our own right. Also as a team, we want, to, we want to make sure that the program delivers not just funding, that we're not just seen as administrators of funding, but that we deliver a service which is supportive, which is inclusive, which is involved, engaged, and which is friendly as well. This is the first year, it's a pilot year, so it's a great opportunity to continue to work with you and get your feedback, your input, and that we refine things as we go along to make sure that, that the program meets your objectives. Later, my colleague Walter will be delivering a full workshop on, on, on it, so you will learn more about the details on how to apply and the application process and so on, and, and can engage in a discussion. But just I'll finish with the strap line for, for Tithe, which is Tithe is about taking Wales to the world and bringing the world to Wales. 
So we really hope that you will join us on this exciting journey uh, moving forward. And uh, we look forward to working with you. So thank you. Thank you, Susanna. And um, yeah, really excited to be working with you on the program. Um, and I think, you know, we, we, we share that ambition to make sure that the programme benefits those people who perhaps have the fewest qualifications, those who've been perhaps you know, looking for that second chance to access education, to really give them, I think as Scott talked about at the start, that kind of life changing opportunity of experiencing education in another part of the world. And um, yeah, and also bringing people to Wales as well. I think it's really, so I'm delighted to be working with you on it. And I know Kay has already posted in the chat the link to the website and please do join the um, workshop um, if you'd like to find out more information about how to apply. Um, okay, now I'm going to hand over to um, our next speaker and um, Sue Pember, um, you may, as the Minister mentioned, uh, wrote the reports for the Wales Centre for Public Policy uh, recently on uh, sort of lifelong learning. Now Sue is uh, very much Welsh, just down the road from me in Ponty, um, but actually works a day job in England and um, we keep dragging her back into Wales and we're very, very grateful for her time again today. A second event she's done for us this this week and we're very, very grateful. Um, Sue, I'm going to hand straight over to you to um, talk about your reports, um, which I'm hoping most people have read or at least uh, heard about. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Sue. Thanks, David. Um, I just want to have a taste in England. I just want to want it. I want Susanna to come and work. Um, we need to talk. Um, I'm just going to share my screen or try to in the, um, in a second. Um, I hope you will be able to see it. We've already practiced this, but lifelong learning hasn't quite got to me yet. All this. OK, from the beginning. I'm hoping you can see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. brilliant. Um, uh, so, so right. Um, now, this is really interesting because this report was done last year and it was absolutely fantastic to hear the minister talk this morning because some of those um, recommendations that we have in this report, he's actually now talking about like they're embedded. So that's an interesting position for me to be in. So first of all, um, this work came from um, the Welsh Centre for Public Policy. They were asked by Welsh Government to look at several questions around um, lifelong learning. And um, what I'm going to do today, I'm not no way going to go through the report. It's about 90 pages and annexes, and um, and you can get at the full report if you haven't seen it here. So I'm I've just picked out things that I think would be going to be relevant to this audience, and I'm going to go through them um, quite quickly. Um, but the first one I wanted to say and remind us all, and I don't think I need to with this audience, but I keep on feeling the need to remind people why lifelong learning is really important. And um, we talk about it now quite often, um, but why is the rest of the world talking about lifelong learning? It isn't all to do with that, um, this sounds dreadful and quite harsh, that governments want to be nice to their people. It's actually because there's a whole set of global issues that lifelong learning can actually um, resolve. Starting off with things like recovering from COVID, like global warming, that now people need to know about it. You know, the issues that we've got around Brexit, the issues with migration. And then there's lots of issues, legacy issues about place and individual. Um, you know, we talked, the minister talked about poor um, English maths and Welsh in Wales. We have got a legacy in the UK of poor skills. I'm still not really, you know, I, though I've been working in this field forever and I spent a big part of my time on literacy and numeracy. I am still amazed that, you know, our young people coming out of school have still got issues with that going to adulthood. Um, we've got unemployment. We've still got mining villages, not just in Wales, but in places like Kent and, and, and Yorkshire. Um, and we've got areas of worklessness and lack of ambition and aspiration. And that's the two words that worry me the most. So when we talk as professionals about lifelong learning, that's fine. But when you talk to some you know, young people, I call them young, but people in their 30s, and talk about their aspirations and do they want to go back to learning, they've had such a bad um, experience in school um, that actually lifelong learning isn't the word that we think it is. They're actually quite um, scared and nervous about it. And I think sometimes we, we sort of forget that. 
And then going forward, um, what are the jobs of the future? We've got new technology, we've got artificial intelligence, we've got, was it, driverless cars, all the risks of redundancy. Um, we've got new industries, we talk about the green industries, but we've got new industries we've yet defined. All, most of us, um, even people on this call today, um, we might need a midlife career change. You know, it's no good thinking that we're going to go through life doing the job that we trained for in our early 20s. Life isn't like that at this moment. And therefore, we're also being told we've got to, you know, our pension might not happen until our, you know, 68th or 70th year or even longer. So we also got the older worker. And looking at COVID, yes, there's been a bit of a bounce back, but older workers still haven't bounced back into employment. So we, we have a whole set of issues there. And then linking it then to well-being and improving health and, and children's well-being. Um, we know that lifelong learning um, it does improve people's health and it is actually cheaper uh, for people with moderate learning, to, um, moderate um, mental health issues to actually go on an adult education course than it is through traditional medication. And we do know that, you know, there is a generational thing here. If we can improve adults reading, it improves their children's reading. So when we use the words lifelong learning, um, we have to bear in mind all the time that lifelong learning is about solutions to many of these productivity and societal issues. Um, and I, I, again, I've done this slide just so that we, we ground ourselves in the work that needs to happen. And that, you know, it is about, in the end, place of individuals and how we improve our communities. And although I love um, the concept of skills, it isn't all about skills, not in those sort of very hard nosed vocational skills. It is about improvements to life. Um, I know the report has 15 recommendations and the first one was actually about a definition for lifelong learning. And um, it was really um, important to me to, to, to get across into the, in this report that the term lifelong learning um, has been hijacked a bit. Um, it, it's often thought about now as a word used for post-19 education. Actually, um, it's a word that should be used from the age of naught. You know, in our Scandinavian countries, our colleagues there, um, you know, is young youngsters, little ones who will get into their minds early on that education is forever. You know, you're not going to get to 16 and then just leave. You're not going to get to 22 and do a degree and just leave. It's forever. And therefore, although Wales, I think, has gone a long way now in their commitment to a part of lifelong learning, I'm still waiting to see the narrative and the expression that makes it really all age. And then all stages. Uh, and what I mean by that, yeah, is for the seven-year-old, the 27-year-old, the 47-year-old and the 77-year-old. It's at all stages and at all levels. So it's about um, whether you're just learning to read as a youngster or an adult, or it's about doing that master's degree, or it is taking a, um, not going up, up, up the ent 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 educational levels, but actually, you know, taking a time out and going sideways and doing something else, whether that is like taking yourself out of the financial um, service industry and going into the craft industry, of going from the craft industry into the financial services, is about sideways moves as well as the way um, up. It's also about skills and knowledge. So it's not just about getting your level three, four and five in some vocational subject. That's fine, that's good. And we do need that for, um, for productivity. But, but we also know that we can, you know, people are more productive if they're happy, if their mental well-being is good and about their general knowledge about life and the way things work and about their, their ability to, to understand, you know, how democracy works and, and areas of life. Um, which are not just vocational skills. So I'm not knocking vocational skills. I made my living out of it. Uh, however, I do know that just being incredibly skills-based and trying to fix the, the, the future skills and individuals and do that sort of matching is actually incredibly difficult. And what is more um, important is empowering those learners. So it was really good that the ministers talked about or a promise of a learner charter. Because if you empower the learner, 
to take control of their lives and make them competent and resilient. They actually can work out where they need to do their skills training and where the next job is. But if you don't empower those learners, then it doesn't work. The system begins to, to fall apart. And it was good that David asked the minister about, all, about settings. Community settings are incredibly important. Yes, more learning is going to be done for content online. But what we've learned from COVID is that all that excitement that we had for online learning at the beginning was fine. It was all right. It was needed. However, people are now beginning to be quite um, demotivated by it. The light bulb moment doesn't seem to happen online. It's when people meet people, it's when um, instructors or lecturers explain a concept, it's when other students explain and push other learners along. So it needs to be in all settings. And that's one of the things that I was pushing in the report. You know, there are lots of educational settings in Wales, but they are still um, pigeonholed for a certain type of um, learner. So university students go to university, college students go to college, community learning students go to community settings. Why? All those buildings should be open for absolutely everybody and the resources should be able to be used and spread. And um, uh, you talk to think uh, when David asked the question to the minister about a community setting. Um, I, I'd like, and I wonder if you've got a number because when we looked um, 18 months ago um, about the previous year in England, how many settings were being used? It was 10,000 um, learning settings. They could be um, Tesco's free training room. Um, it could be that church or um, Sikh Hall, but it's amazing where education should be taking part. And that's when it comes to the sort of final component of a lifelong learning strategy. It's about informal and formal. And again, I think that it's now you've got a chance to bring in that properly in Wales so that the informal side of adult education is given as much prominence as the formal side. Um, because the world we live in is changing and we need um, those informal settings to bring people back in, into education. So that's one of the recommendations um, in the report about you know, what a lifelong learning strategy should look like and um, what the components are, are of it. However, um, although I'm critical, I'm very excited about what's happening in Wales, um, the way that the minister talks about it and all the, you know, you've got many of those components, um, but you don't have a shared narrative as yet. It's coming along, it's coming along. So what I would like to see personally, um, and it, it can be, a, this is just a flavour. I'm not saying to Welsh government, they should adopt this like every word in the way that is written. But we talked, um, uh, you know, as Susanna talked about what Taith is trying to do uh, about taking Wales to the world and bringing the world to Wales. Um, uh, that's in, in fantastic. And it sort of the, is where I feel you should be. Um, Wales should be, and it should brand itself, the land of lifelong learning, available to all, every stage and at every sphere of people's lives. Um, and there should be an under, underpinning narrative you know, is about the economy, is about community, and is about wider society. Um, and it's about collectively addressing all the challenges that Wales has. Um, many are, are from my front first slide um, can re be reflected in Wales today. You know, there are, you know, third generation unemployed, there are pockets where there is no adult learning, there is um, a, a still uh, an understanding that, you know, um, there is a, an aspiration issue with some people and that learning is not for them. So, you know, th there is multiple challenges in Wales, but lifelong learning can help address them. And it's about, you know, learning fosters people's and employers' capacity to deal with change. And again, you know, that is not going to come through a direct skills um, programme. It's going to come on with that add-on, with the confidence building that we've already talked about. And then we need to make sure that, um, you know, 
uh, learning does lead to individual fulfillment and how do we measure that and I think there is a question mark out of that and I think as professionals we've been a bit slow to actually provide um, funders with the sort of outcomes that can be measurable in the more um, softer skills in that familiar fulfillment and well-being space and I think we need to work on that and of course it does lead to improved productivity and it's also about culture and the civic fabric of Wales um, you know there, there would be a sadness I think um, for you know if Wales lost that pos position it has um, you know with, with soft things like the set of the Estedford that gives you know world um, famous opera singers and musicians have come from that 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 actual um, uh, uh, important fabric of Wales needs to be enhanced and it come through lifelong learning. And then, you know, you put all those together, um, you know, lifelong learning breaks that cycle of low achievement and re renews and builds economies um, and communities. So it would be fantastic that when the, the, the new bill um, is properly an early act as it is, and the commission starts to do its work, that a new narrative is created for Wales. And like I said, it builds on a lot of what we've got, you've got already. Um, uh, and um, in the recommendations, these are just three, and I, I've gone through all these, all age, wider benefits to include um, health and well-being and culture, not just to, to, to the skill side is really important, but to take it that one step further. And this year is a big year for lifelong learning. UNESCO has is, is got a big focus. And I would really love to see, as we speak, really, um, Wales working with, or even taking the lead in developing the UK's um, contribution to the UNESCO's lifelong learning. I also um, wanted to, just to talk about quickly, and I know um, I'm a bit conscious of time here, um, about rights and entitlements. Uh, the, the, the full document um, sets up a set of rights and entitlements, and these are um, being covered in the new Act. Uh, uh, however, I think it can go further. Um, so, you know, when there is a funding right at this moment to, to you know, nursery, school and college, um, it just needs to go that bit, bit further and be, I feel, use the language of entitlements. But saying that, you've gone a long way in the last five months, so I'm not going to quibble really over particular words. But I would like to see a, a bigger emphasis on, on, the, on the language and people know that they can get um, free provision and people can know that they can get up to and including a level two free. And um, I think it's really important that young people in Wales uh, feel that they have a right to participate in an employed apprenticeship and, uh, you know, and a, a, a right and entitlement to stay on in education over the age of 16. Um, and I also feel that the last bullet point, and I think we got a flavour of that from the, you, a minister, but I believe we've got a right to a joined up government response to lifelong education, and that's education, working with work and pensions, with health and other departments, uh, and working, um, you know, for holistic solutions for individuals, um, including older people, families and workers in, with employers. I say that, um, and that's a sort of condensed sentence of what, what's in the report, but, but you can see it, you know, quite often that, you know, um, one part of the Welsh Government does one thing and another part of Welsh Government does another. It would be fantastic if they could be joined up, and I think that would be um, better for everybody. Now, on roles and responsibilities, you've got the new Commission. Um, and I'm really hopeful that the new commission will be a new type of um, arms lens organisation, that it um, is very clear about the roles and responsibilities between Welsh Government, the commission and what um, institutions um, do in Wales uh, and other collective bodies. And this is taken from a UNESCO document, but it would be great if we could possibly have um, uh, a culture that of long line, lifelong learning that is um, 
developed um, within an environment, an enabling environment. Uh, and that to allow that to happen, there needs to be this joined up government. There needs to be multiple spaces um, used for learning. There needs to be well use of technology, a core sufficient funding. But there needs to be a strong shared social fabric of society. The society um, all wants the same thing. And that goes back to the aspiration of the individuals who live in Wales. And of course, there should be inclusive skills and education policies. And um, the strap at the bottom, it says, you know, from early years to a lifetime. And it's supposed to should be informal and it should be also formal. So to me, if Wales can develop this really enabling environment, and I think, um, again, you're, you're right on, on the threshold of doing that now, it will be a fantastic achievement. And one of the things that we were asked in, in, to look at was about how we can support, how could Welsh Government in support institutions to increase participation? And I just brought this slide in, it's sort of two thirds of the way through um, in the report. And one of the things that came out from me talking to um, institutions, uh, all, all different types from universities to colleges to adult ed, um, institutions was that you need from government now a consistency and, stain and sustained key message and narrative. There's been some brilliant words spoken um, and written about um, adult education in Wales over the last 10, 15 years, but they're not sustained. And now you need that long term vision and funding certainty. You definitely need what they're looking at in England at the moment, which is three year funding agreements uh, and 10 year visions for funding. It definitely needs all those types of um, uh, certainties put in place. And there also needs to be this understanding that actually um, to be quick, on, you know, quick, agile, it's best left to an institution to determine what the local need is. And, um, uh, you know, Wales is geographically quite large to determine, you know, from one central place what a village needs or what a town needs is often not the best way to do it. It's actually giving the flexibility to institutions to determine what is needed for their area. I talked about the joined up government. But I also think now is on institutions to collaboratively work together. So you take a geographical spot in Wales, you say, well, who's working in it? You know, what are the, what colleges you've got, what adult education services you've got, what university, what independence, what national organisations, what informal organisations are there? And you map what is needed and you fill the gaps. And those gaps should be about learner progression, um, clear, clear gateways and signposting where people um, can, can go to and where they can get support. So the last few words are, like I said, I'm really, really excited about where, where you are in Wales. Um, you, you're in a really good place with a very supportive minister and, um, uh, and administration. Um, you've had some new funds, which are unbelievable, to increase participation. Um, you probably don't realise how, how novel that is. Not the rest of the UK hasn't had those sort of funds. You've got a new commission who can now work out, you know, uh, with Welsh Government its remit, but more importantly, how it's going to work, how it's going to be joined up, how it's going to do some of the things I've just described, and how it can reduce bureaucracy. The last thing you need is a new, new commission that becomes very admin, very processed, very um, you know, uh, spreadsheet orientated um, monitoring outcomes. You've got a chance to say something new and you've got a promise of a citizen's curriculum and a learner charter. Um, but I know, um, I think you know, there's over 100 on this call. I know, um, I've been, like I said, worked a lifetime in adult education. Nothing will happen unless you know, educational professionals are behind it. You know what you learners need. You know how to help them progress. You know what is needed for your own staff development and how, um, how you can you know, bring about this vision. And it won't happen without your knowledge and expertise. Um, and I'm hoping that that will be really recognized in Wales, that you know, educational professionals as where it is at at this moment and learners absolutely need them. So thank you for that, David. I think I might have run over. Yeah, I think a little bit, that's absolutely fine. I think we're going to move on to the next section. I think so, as if you, 
Um, and you're going to chair the next section, I think, aren't you, for us, Sue? Uh, yeah. The panel. Um, and I'll leave you maybe to, to introduce the speakers, if that's OK. Uh, but thank <laughs> you. Yeah, and again, just on behalf of Loving Work, thank you for your support. But also thank you for the report, because I think it's given a kind of shot in the arm for us to move forward here in Wales. Brilliant. Thank you for that. And like I said, it's nice to have a report when things get at impact. I'm sorry, I've been packed straight away. Um, so this session is really interesting because um, there's a panel and they're each going to, and I think it's just about um, time, um, they're each going to talk for three to four minutes on um, uh, how Wales can build a second chance nation. Um, and uh, it's quite interesting because Catherine and I seem to be following her us around for the last 24 hours or 48 hours, um, but that's all right. So we got Catherine first, then Kieran from University of Wales, then, then Phil um, from the Vale of Glamorgan and then Kelly Fountain. So we're going to start, Catherine, with you. So you've got three to four minutes. What a challenge. Thank you very much, Sue. So Pranhanda, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Catherine Robson. I'm the Chief Executive of Avisk Oidol Young Cymru Adult Learning Wales, the National Community College and Voluntary Movement for ACL in Wales. With around 25,000 enrolments annually, we are the largest ACL provider of pre-entry learning to professional level qualifications and delivering 50% of all ACL provision in Wales. It was so lovely to hear from Scott earlier, such an inspirational story and so glad that one of our founding organisations, Colleg Harlech, was there to support and, and, and inspire you, Scott. Um, you're an inspiration to us. Um, so thank you so much for, for, for sharing your story once again today. And, and good to hear also from our minister talking about the citizens curriculum and the National Charter for Lifelong Learning. As an organisation, we are very much looking forward to taking a lead role in supporting this exciting development. So the question, how do we build a second chance nation? This is a huge question and the answers are far reaching. I could speak for hours on this. However, I only have a few minutes, so I'll try to summarise in four key points. First, I'd like to talk about collaboration or shared responsibility, as the minister mentioned earlier. The key to succeeding in building a second chance nation is establishing a genuine desire for all post-16 providers to collaborate in a meaningful and holistic way to deliver the best solutions. Now, that collaboration should extend to schools, the third sector, health and social care services, social prescribers, the criminal justice service, youth and play work and other providers. We need to work uh, with a broad range of organisations to ensure that people who know what they're talking about through the lived experiences of those whom they support are given the platform to expose the barriers to learning, particularly around ensuring a focus on the Welsh language, ethnic diversity, disability, illness, poverty, isolation and digital exclusion. We are so fortunate to have a Minister for Education and, and Welsh Language who is committed to building a second chance nation and under his direction the newly formed external reference group which you mentioned earlier is now in place and we are part of that I'm very pleased to say. Uh, this is reviewing adult learning with the aim of delivering a programme of national coordination uh, for Wales. Now, this could deliver significant results for lifelong learning and would also recognise health and social benefits. Three points, not four points, sorry. Secondly, educational inequalities. Um, building a second chance nation depends on getting underneath the skin of inequalities and widening participation. And as I mentioned earlier, understanding the barriers. Now, there is no simple answer as to how we address inequalities in education and with widening participation, but understanding the interplay between learners' motivation, their capabilities and their access to opportunities is vital. As you heard from Sue Pember earlier, supporting the, the Welsh Lifelong Learning System report is out and makes compelling reading. It shows that there is a growing trend of working age adults in Wales being underqualified and lacking essential skills. 
As the, as the minister mentioned earlier, almost half of adults from the lowest socioeconomic groups have not received any training since they left full-time education. In Wales, the proportion of adults with a level four qualification and above is 4% below the UK average. There are inequalities regarding disability with 15.2% of disabled people having no qualifications compared to 4.9% of non-disabled people. And there are inequalities regarding geographical distribution of delivery too. And finally, my third point, let's look at priorities for adult community learning specifically. Now, Estin and others identified that the adult community learning sector has important strengths and what is provided is generally good. However, there is a need for more provision in areas like ESOL and essential skills, which is vital to support economic and social integration. There is a need for additional support for those learners struggling to reach level two in order to be able to progress to further education, work-based learning and employment. There is a need for a viable funding model for the provision of non-accredited courses, which contribute to learners' well-being and can support that step back into education. There needs to be a clearer strategy for the role of adult learning and improving employ employability skills. And clearly the launch of the Welsh Government's employability plan uh, will and should provide some structure and direction here. And there should be a commitment to supporting learners to be skilled rather than to have skills. What I mean by that is to develop people's critical thinking skills and be empowered to become active citizens in their communities. So in summary, one, greater collaboration, delivering lifelong learning solution and recognising health and wellbeing and social benefits. Two, addressing educational inequalities. And three, delivering priorities through ACL to enable progression, not forgetting the importance to help people to be skilled and be empowered rather than to have a set of skills, but not have the confidence or the resilience to be able to use them effectively. Individual fulfillment, as Sue mentioned earlier. Thank you for listening to me. Diolch and fawr iawn. Brilliant, Catherine. That was great. And it sort of reinforced some of the things that I was talking about, but in a much more eloquent way. Um, so if we can move now on to Kieran, and we are going to be able to make a bit of a panel. So if you have any great questions, put them onto the Q&A part. So if we go Kieran Reese now from the University of Wales, Kieran. Thanks, Sue. Um, hi, hi, everyone. Yes, yeah, so I'm um, Kieran Rees and I'm from Universities Wales, where the representative body for Welsh universities. Um, and I, I'm only going to talk uh, quite briefly, which is which is good, because actually I only have a few minutes um, on, I think, within the building of a, a second chance nation, what's the role of universities, what, what universities do uh, already, and I think how we can, what we may you know, need to look at doing differently. I think very grateful that actually Sue covered off one of the things I wanted to talk about, which is actually why all this matters. And too often we talk very much in terms of skills for jobs, skills response to business need. But I think helpful focus from Sue on um, actually the the personal benefits from education that we know, you know, that are well evidenced on well being and health. Uh, as well as some of the big changes we're facing as a country, you know, possible occupation shrinkage as a result of technological change, the, the challenges around net zero. And actually in Wales, we have a very particular um, uh, set of circumstances around our demographics. We have an aging population at a faster rate than elsewhere in the UK. And for the next uh, seven to eight years, we have a shrinking pool of new entrants to the workforce, um, which it inevitably will have implications for for um, the availability of, of suitably qualified people um, in Wales. So I, I, I think for, for us, our view is education is trans transformational. It, it, it transforms lives. Um, and we have in Wales a strong record of, of widening access. Um, but I think it's helpful to look 
at the role of universities more broadly. I mean, everybody typically will think of universities as being for 18 to 21 year olds um, doing uh, undergraduate degrees because that's a big part of what universities do. But actually, a third of our students are over the age of 30. Um, and, and when you look at the source of activities universities do, it covers things such as workplace delivery, um, continuing professional development. So Welsh universities deliver 250,000 days of CPD a year, short courses in community, but also then, and I think the other thing I thought was really interesting to, uh, that was raised earlier in, in the day was, was the importance of those informal settings. Um, and universities do perform a civic role as well. They, you know, we see short courses delivered in community centres, in in other edu through other education providers, um, but also opportunities for informal learning, such as exhibitions, open lectures. And I think the use of those community assets is, is something that we have a, a good track record of, but can also you know, look to expand upon as well. The other thing um, I, I, I was going to mention, which Catherine raised, which is, of course, the qualification levels in Wales. Um, and when you look at us compared to the UK as a whole, we have more people who have no qualifications and we have a uh, lower proportion of people who have higher education qualifications. Um, so, so in Wales, it, uh, the makeup of, our, you know, of what people, uh, what qualifications people have is, is tilted. And I think related to that and what we are, you know, are always keen to explore is how disadvantage and inequality persists. You know, uh, it used to be the, the society would help you get to level two and, and then you're on your own, there was level three. And, and actually when, when you look at it, there was an interesting piece of work um, from the Sutton Trust last year, which shows that actually, uh, it's not, you know, it's not essentially surprising, but those from the most disadvantaged backgrounds, even if they get to say level five, level six, are less likely to progress onto level seven. Um, and I think we know higher attainment uh, through the levels to, delivers those benefits Sue was, was talking about. And there's something in the same translation about making sure people can travel across this, across the qualification levels really, and that we remove as many barriers as possible. Um, we're, we're really fortunate in Wales because we actually have a student support system that makes a lot of that possible. We have support for postgraduate students um, that delivers the equivalent of a living wage. We have support for part-time students. Um, we, we maintain a progressive grant system. So in that sense, um, in that sense, we, we have removed quite a few barriers already. But I think, you know, without going into detail in this sort of opening gap, but there are other things we can look at about how we can get provision more accessible across different communities, how we can better use the credit and transfer system, but also how we can expand upon some of those informal opportunities. I think the the last point I wanted to make, I, I, it was a really interesting slide you put up, Sue, on how we can support increased participation. And I'd add another point, actually, which is role models. Um, we, we held a roundtable recently on, on lifelong learning, and, and one of the learners attending spoke a bit about her reasons for going back to, well, going to higher education as, as an adult learner. Um, and, she, you know, she was very clear, it was a very big step for her. But the thing that made a difference is her younger brother had gone to university, and she'd sort of seen the benefits of that, and that gave her... So the, the idea, the confidence to, to look into pursuing it herself. Um, and initially she talked about doing it because she wanted a, a better job. She wanted a, more of a career. But she said by she, the time she got to her third year, um, she didn't really care about the job so much anymore. Um, she, she was just enjoying the learning. And I think that sort of reflects a number of the comments people have made um, over the course of the day. And then she said that um, after, a couple of years after she'd gone to university, her husband was made redundant. So he decided to go to university as well. So I think there is something about the visibility. You know, I think it's, if you know someone who's done it or if you can see someone who's done it, um, it, it makes it much easier to make that step yourself um, as well. That's all I'm going to say at this point. Thank you. Brilliant, Phil. Um, Kira, and I totally agree with that as well. Yeah. Um, if you've got one family member, you should be able to get 20. I mean, that should be a target for everybody. One in, 20 more. Um, right, Phil. Um, Phil from Southard. Uh, Phil Southard from Vale of Morgan. How are you doing, Phil? I think he is there. 
uh, Sue, but I, he, he hasn't turned the camera on or Michael's made Mark's move on to the next participant. Maybe. Okay, so that's Kelly Fountain. Hello, Kelly. Hey, uh, how are you? We're good. Brilliant, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to speak to you on behalf of the FE sector. I'm Kelly Fountain and I'm the Vice Principal for Academic Services at NPTC Group of Colleges and I'm also the Chair of the Talbot and Powys Joint ACL Partnership. And I think from an FE perspective, FE has literally given thousands of people second chance in education. So for me, becoming a second chance nation is positive, as it'll pick people up who've missed out on opportunities the first time round. There are a substantial number of people in Wales and across the UK where FE has played a major catalyst in changing lives. And we've heard about the transformational impact this afternoon. But for me, there are four key priorities to us becoming a successful second chance nation. Some of these priorities have been mentioned by my colleagues, um, which is really reassuring because it just reinforces how important they are. Firstly, education has to be accessible in the community. We must remember that for some of our adult learners, actually putting a foot into an educational institution may be a step too far, especially if they've had the previous poor experience of education the first time round. The real value of adult learning lies in its potential to reach individuals close to home, particularly those who might not have otherwise engaged in learning, and whether it be that that delivery takes place in the local community centre, the church hall, or even through utilising innovative ways of, of delivery, such as the use of technology. I think that's really, really important. Secondly, for me, the curriculum offer has to be right. We've heard a lot today about the importance of informal learning. I think unaccredited courses may be the first step of a learner's journey. And it may be that that initial informal leisure type course creates that enjoyment and love of learning, which then acts as a catalyst to lead to more formal progression opportunities later on. I think when learners have tasted educational success, sometimes for the first time, this can create the desire for more leading to onward progression. And that's not to mention the huge benefits in terms of health and well-being, helping overcome loneliness and isolation and the benefits to the economy. Thirdly, Ensuring that learners have access to excellent support, I think, is absolutely vital. Providing excellent support and transition throughout the learner journey is a really important way of improving confidence, raising aspirations and helping overcome some of the previous barriers and previous preconceptions that might have turned people off from education in the first place. Finally, and not surprisingly, coming from an FE perspective, I firmly believe that colleges should form the institutional backbone of an inclusive lifelong learning system. I feel that ACL partnerships which are most successful are those where there is true collaboration and that's been said a number of times this afternoon. And that cl collaboration between local authorities, the third sector, all education providers and employers, but also with the college at the centre of that collaboration. Having a unified approach to delivery, focusing on the impact that that partnership would like to make to the overall learning journey of an adult learner is critical. And I think FE can do all of those things in terms of the diverse range of curriculum on offer, the level of expertise available, the infrastructure and the resource available to support and enhance community learning, including the opportunity to maximise funding to ensure that education is affordable to all. And that's it from me, Sue. Thank you very much. Brilliant, Kelly. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, uh, great. So I think we've now got Phil. Um, the Vale of Glamorgan is having um, connectivity issues. Hi, Phil. Hi, thank you very much. Okay, um, you've had a good afternoon, so now is probably a good time to go make a cup of tea. No, I'm only joking. Uh, Pranamda, obviously I'm gonna answer the question on how to build a second chance nation from an adult community learning perspective. Um, adult community learning has always offered public as many chances as they needed, really. 
And as a sector, we've always fought to maintain flexibility in our curriculum offer in order that we're able to meet local need. And there's sound logic in that. Clearly the local needs in Anglesey will differ from those in Cardiff and, and so forth throughout the, the nation. There are though undoubtedly certain skills and competencies that everyone needs in order to reach their full potential, maintain their well-being, engage fully as a citizen and live in harmony with others. I believe the time is right now to develop and offer a citizen's curriculum for Wales that consistently covers these skills and competencies wherever learners live, while maintaining that reasonable level of flexibility to ensure the learner remains at the centre. There were calls in recent adult learning meetings to have a national marketing campaign. Well, currently that would be very difficult indeed because it would need to include dozens of websites and dozens of curriculum offers, uh, as almost every provider across the country offers something slightly different. If we as providers can work in partnership with our learners and, and grasp the opportunity that Welsh Government has given us to develop the citizens curricula for Wales with a consistency of qualification relevance and quality with more easily understood progression pathways, then we'd have a product that we can take to the marketplace nationally. This approach has worked well for the Centre for Learning Welsh and congratulations to them, Diane. They have established a, a curriculum and an easily understood progression route and a strong brand that they market nationally very effectively. We need this approach to help re-engage our learners post-COVID and we need it soon. Yes, the curriculum would need to be constantly reviewed and updated in line with the Regional Skills Consortium mapping exercises and national data analysis, but at least we would be comparing apples with apples and the data would have real meaning and give us proper guidance. That doesn't mean we'd have to lose that local or regional flexibility. We'd still need to retain a percentage of that offer to be reactive and responsive to local need and retain our wonderful differences whilst we strive for a nationwide consistency. I think this would be one of the major building blocks for a second trans nation. If we get the curriculum right, then we can get the accreditation right and the progression right and create, create that lifelong learning culture we need for Wales. Thank you. Brilliant, Phil. Um, and fantastic from all of you. And it's interesting because you all talk about collaboration. Um, you all talk about doing it together. Um, and a bit of me then is left with the question, well, why aren't you? Um, and uh, you're doing it in certain areas, I know, but it, it does need to, that good practice needs to spread um, right, right across Wales. Um, and um, I'm being a bit of the, you know, a bit of the pu hard pusher here, really. Uh, I think you've got that chance to do it now and you do need to do it. And I don't think you need um, uh, you know, to stand your ground and say, well, we're the universities, we're the colleges, we're ACL. You're actually one service now for lifelong learning. And I think that would be a sort of ch change of way. I've only got one question, which is a bit sad, really. Uh, and that question is for me, which says, um, would you agree that um, community venues are st a stepping stone um, to other learning venues? Well, absolutely. Um, and I also don't believe it's a stepping stone upwards. In, I don't know, can you have a stepping stone upwards? But sometimes it's a stepping stone across as well. So you can be highly educated, but actually your mental health is really um, a bit, you need a bit of support. So it's then a stepping stone into a community um, activity to go forward. But then I also know, um, you know, that you can take, you know, part of a degree um, so you can be doing one profession, so you can have a stepping stone that way. And, and that is quite a complex way of thinking about things. But absolutely, those local venues are the beginnings of, um, of it all, really. But also it's those local venues that build communities. It's there, you know, it's where people meet, it's where people, they, they can ponder on the, the needs of their particular area. So it's not, it, it, it's where the priorities get created in those local centres. So if there's not any other questions, my panel is looking a bit like, well, you know, we should have questions. Um, you know, uh, have we got any more coming through? I know the time is up to three o'clock.
Okay, no, 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 no formal questions for the Q and A. Um, I've just got one last question um, uh, from for for you all. Um, you know, taking in the same order. If only one one thing happens between now and the new year, what would be the the one that had the most impact? One thing, one short sentence. Yeah. So if I start with Catherine. Right, um, this is the unfortunate thing of going first, but the thing that comes to mind for me, which I think needs to be addressed and would be such a huge development for us is to recognise education as a, um, a, a really important aspect that supports social prescribing once and for all. Brilliant. Between prescription. Brilliant. Okay, Kieran. It's a tough question, um, Sue. So one one thing before, um, well, so uh, you know, possibly a boring one, but actually, I think the bill the bill is due to pass stage four and get royal assent in the summer, and I think making sure that that bill is passed in a way that actually does incentivise and facilitate better join up rather than um, rather than competition between different parts of the sector would be could could be transformational actually and I mean just to touch on your point I think there is there is a lot of collaboration going on um, at the moment and there's there's very good models out there but there, there's something about scale and there's something about visibility I think that, that could help that to develop those collaborations further yeah visibility I think is the key to that to that so, uh, Phil are you with well, this you're not on my screen at this moment yes I'm here so what would you have one thing between now and Christmas? Um, to, um, to partly answer your question again about why haven't we been collaborating, we've never had a platform like we've been offered now by, by this government, that external group, etc. What I'd really like is for us to grab hold of that and, and really work hard at it between now and the end of the year and actually get some, some definite decisions laid down so that all providers know where they're going. Brilliant, Phil. Yeah, you can self-organise now. I think you've been given permission to do that. Um, and Kelly, last word for you, really. Yeah, for me, I think the funding needs to be flexible. Having a joined up approach um, and awareness of all providers, of the funding opportunities that are um, available, actually. You know, things are getting tighter, inflation rates are rising. We don't want informal non-accredited courses to be the first thing that goes really it's essential not to cut them and on your point of collaboration the partnership that i chair is extensive actually we're embryonic we voluntary merged and it stems from having the third sector represented employers Avarice with university swansea university the college and two local authorities so it's starting but it's, it's very much in it in its infancy that's brilliant. And I, I do have two questions now. Uh, and it is quite interesting um, on the adult community learning side of it, on the sort of non-accredited, because in, in England, the devolved areas, you know, like Manchester and London, they couldn't, under couldn't understand originally the worth. You know, they wanted to put all their monies into level three and above. After two and a half years, they suddenly realised, well, not suddenly, quite a bit of lobbying has gone beyond behalf, but they suddenly realised that gives them a lot of agileness. It allows them to do what learners need really quickly. And whether that is reacting you know, to the, to the refugee crisis that we sometimes see or um, to the you know, unemployment in certain areas because of redundancy. So I am absolutely, um, I hope, I'm, I'm feeling a bit of reassurance from this minister that he totally understands that, that you just need it or you can't be agile in the skills world. And one of the questions is on free ESOL provision for all at entry level. Well, it's amazing me to be able to say, but in England last week, the minister more or less announced that. So we need to make sure that that now happens in Wales because you can't be behind. You've been in front on everything in this, in this area so far. And then, Catherine, what, what, one question for you is... Um, uh, how, uh, what kind of support you feel awarding organisations so can support providers, especially in that sort of ESOL area? Well, I think I think it's really important to understand the issues and to work with awarding organisations. Again, that collaboration coming into it, talking to the partners across the ACL space. Um, 
I think we, we would need to draw on our curriculum leads to determine how best to arrange that support. Um, but I think it's about exploring the issues, coming together and trying to resolve any potential bureaucracy or barriers in that respect. Okay, brilliant. Um, well, that's my, my time over with you. I'm going to hand back to David now. Thanks for that, everybody, and thanks for your um, contributions there. Um, I'm glad, glad. it's, it's been wonderful to be on something where we're all smiling. So over to you, David. Great, thanks, Sue, and um, thanks to the panellists as well. And uh, I, I, I think it shows, and what, what I really liked about the panel was just that we had the breadth of sectors represented, the breadth of the sector represented, and that kind of commonality of purpose there around collaboration, I think, you know, really is an opportunity. And I, I, I want to sort of re one of the points Kieran made, I think, it just about um, second chance being about the kind of travel across, travel through the qualifications as well. And it's really, really important. A second chance isn't just about, you know, kind of gaining, gaining your first qualification or gaining your level two or level three. It has to be that opportunity to progress um, through levels and across the sector. Um, and so you did mention at the start of behind the scenes about one of the reasons uh, you're reluctant to come back to Wales is the weather. I can confirm it snowed here in Caerphilly during your um, during your presentation. Now it's sunny again. So thank you ever so much, Sue, for your contribution today and um, for, the, for the generous the way you've given your time over the last um, um, few months and this week uh, to Learning and Work Institute. Um, very conscious now of time, we're a couple of minutes over, but I think that the conversation was so good. So. We are going to have the final um, session is going to be the workshop, the, uh, the Tithe workshop. So there's a link that's just been posted into the chat. And I think what we'll do to allow people to come for a break, we'll begin that session at um, quarter past three, if that's OK with participants. Give you a chance to go and grab a cup of tea or a drink or something. Um, thank you ever so much for everyone who's attended today the minister and all, all the other speakers. Um, a big thanks to the team at Learning and Work Institute. Um, some of you have been battling through sort of COVID and other things in the last couple of weeks, um, and particularly to Wendy for her work in pulling all this together and Kay for organising lots of stuff behind the scenes and the speakers. So thank you ever so much. Uh, we're hoping there is a, a real opportunity that when we come back next year for this conference, we'll be able to see a substantial amount of progress um, on this agenda. And um, uh, thank you. I would say, I would normally say safe travels home, but um, obviously, we hope both people I think are at home. But I hope most of you will be able to join as well with the um, workshop um, shortly. Thanks ever so much, everyone.